Hello, BookTube. I want to try, perhaps in vain, to preserve live mail halls on this channel. <laughs> I have failed twice in the last two days to make a mail haul that I could upload. Uh, one where I wasn't yelling for 40 minutes to an hour before I came to my senses again and started talking like a normal person. So I'm going to try that for this video. But before I try that, I want to tell you a story. It's the story of, let's just say, a book reviewer who gets the galley of a new book in the mail, and he reads it, and it's fairly engaging. It's the story of a young Guatemalan immigrant, a man, who comes to the San Fernando Valley in order to get work. And he lives outside the valley just a bit and commutes to work when he can. Now, sometimes this young Guatemalan man decides to fly to work. Because, as the narrative in the book says, 30 to 40 percent of all Guatemalan men have six-foot-long wings that can be extended out from their shoulder blades on either side. Some of these men, most of them, the wings are a vaguely manila color or white. Every once in a while, the wings will be black. The plumage will be black. Our main character has black wings. And it's exhausting. It requires an extra meal once he's... Once he's come back down to earth, it's exhausting to do, so he doesn't always decide to fly to work. But sometimes he does, and when he does, there's always a feeling of community because there's always at least one or two other Guatemalan immigrants who are flying, either to work or from work or whatnot. But he often denies himself that pleasure in order to go to work, and he's dealing at work with uh, the fact that his paycheck just doesn't go far enough. He not only wants to afford his apartment and rudimentary health insurance, but he also wants to send money home to Guatemala. And the, his paycheck just isn't covering that. And that leaves him with only the option of finding more work, finding uh, some way to make more money. And he quickly discovers in the course of the book that there are ways and there are ways. There are, that right at hand, there will always be ways to make more money. But it, they come at the cost of ethical sacrifices. And since part of the reason that he's sending money home to Guatemala is because his mother is suffering from early onset dementia, he feels an extra moral weight not to lose his thread on how to be a good person in the world. And the reviewer reads this book and finds it very interesting, including large parts of it that speak to the immigrant working experience in, in a very appealingly direct voice. And the reviewer writes a review uh, along those lines and uh, praises the book, mentions that the, uh, the elements of magical realism, the obvious elements of magical realism, seem a little bit out of place, and they don't seem resolved. They don't seem to go anywhere in the course of the book. But that the bulk of the book is extremely accomplished, especially for an English-language debut. And the writer, because it's the name of the game, wants to spread the word about his review, so he uh, teases it when, it when it finally sees print. He teases it on Twitter. And the author of the book sees it immediately, because the author of the book is 20-something and spends literally 20 hours a day on Twitter. The author of the book does not write. He does not do anything. Just basically lives on Twitter. The author of the book sees the critic's review immediately reads it, and then immediately makes a caustic Twitter response saying, um, I don't know what you're saying. Um, there's no magical realism um, in the book, because they phrase every statement as a question. Uh, and the author sees that a day later, because the author has a life and doesn't live on Twitter, and sees that comment and naively thinks, well, the author saw my review the author's picking out one flaw. I must have been pleased with the bulk of the review, because the bulk of the review is extremely thoughtful praise. And perhaps in hindsight, naively, the author responds by saying, well, I'm not saying the book was unbelievable. I'm just talking about the magical realism elements. The main character has wings growing out of his shoulders, and he can fly with them. And the author sees it immediately, because the author spends 20 hours on Twitter and says, um, that's not magical realism. I'm, um, my book is autofiction. Um, it's, it's drawn from my life. The reviewer is totally nonplussed. He has no idea what the author is trying to say. Literally no idea. They're both speaking in English, but he has no idea what the author is trying to say. 
autofiction. Well, okay, the reviewer thought that because the 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 writer's stories about being an immigrant in the San Fernando Valley, about uh, the writer's stories about life in a small town in in Guatemala, those all rang with with uh, an authenticity that probably tips the hand that they are autofiction. Also, the author's last name gives that away or seems to points in that direction. The author is the reviewer is completely nonplussed by the author's response and decides on a whim to go to the author's Facebook page and Instagram. The author being in, in his mid-twenties, there are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of pictures of the author himself. Uh, the, author's, the reviewer is trying to figure out what on earth this author is saying. What are you actually saying about this being autofiction? And he looks at a lot of those pictures and he sees that a lot of them are in Guatemala. And in hindsight, perhaps stupidly, he responds to the author on Twitter again and says, okay, I understand the autofiction part, but um, this isn't completely autofiction because you don't have wings and you can't fly and no Guatemalan man has wings and no Guatemalan man in history has ever been able to fly under his own power and no human being has ever had wings. And a second later, the author of the book responds not with, well, you're reading it wrong, or that's not how I intended it, but rather with a, an astonishing personal insult. The type of personal insult that was once ground for legal action, the type of thing that even at your angriest in society you would not have, have leveled at someone else unless they burnt a cross on your lawn. The author responds by saying, you, the critic, are a bigot. You hate Guatemalan men. By extension, you hate Guatemalans. <laughs> the reviewer reads this. In addition to feeling the sting of being personally insulted, the, the reviewer is now thinking, this has to be some sort of joke. I'm not getting it. But it doesn't make sense. Literally doesn't make sense in any way except as a joke. So the author, perhaps ill-advisedly in retrospect, responds lightheartedly with, well, I just got through scrolling through 200 pictures of you a lot of them are you at the swimming pool or at the beach. You don't have wings. So uh, I'm guessing I must be a bigot. And the author kind of laughs, maybe even puts a little smiley face emoji on that response. Because what else can you do? The author is assuming there is a joke going on here and he just maybe doesn't get some element of it. And he thinks nothing more of it. He thinks, maybe he thinks, well, okay, bad idea to interact with authors on Twitter. Maybe he thinks that. That's probably true. Unless you unqualifiedly love their book in every single syllable probably best, especially if they seem touchy. Then it's probably best not to interact with them. But the author doesn't think anything more of it. Now, the author, the reviewer, doesn't review for a living. He has a job. Uh, and he works as an adjunct professor at his local college. And on the following Monday, he goes to work and notices that he has been requested at his boss's office. Uh, he goes to the boss's office, like most adjunct professors, he's assuming that it's an announcement of a pay cut. <laughs> he goes to his boss's office, and his boss closes the door, takes on a very solemn tone, and says, uh, we've had 12 complaints about you. Emails about you from 12 different people. Uh, saying that you've made really incendiary racist comments on social media. Uh, the reviewer here is aghast absolutely aghast. His first impulse is to tell his boss, I'm really sorry that these 12 crazy people wasted your time. I haven't done anything of the kind. And since it's all public, you can go and look. The boss says, I didn't look. I'm not HR. The reviewer, who's at his day job, says, okay, you're not HR, but what on earth are you talking about HR? Human resources is not involved in this. And the, his boss says, Yes, they are. Look, you're a good guy. You've done a lot of good here. Your students really like you. But I'm going to refer you to HR on this. I haven't looked. They will look into it. So this is, this is a different morning than the one that our reviewer just walked into. This is incredibly serious. He needs this job to live. He goes to HR. And they say, they look very solemn in a very kind and condescending way. And they say, look, we, we've we had complaints that you've made incendiary racist comments online. Now, by now, the reviewer is scared enough 
to be aggressive. And he says, I didn't. I didn't make any such comments. And they are all public. If you call up my, my social media feed, or I can do it for you on my phone right now, I'll show you that there aren't any racist comments there. I, th there's no history anywhere, anywhere in any of my public pronouncements or writings of anything like that. The HR person, again, seems very condescending, very calming, uh, an upset child, and says it won't be necessary to look at your social media feed. What we need is retraining. You need to go to a few classes for retraining, for sensitivity training. Uh, they'll be at night. You won't be compensated for them. And we kind of insist. We, we don't want to make nothing of this. People have complained. You want to, the critic wants to respond with, no, 12 people have complained, and I'd be willing to bet they're all Facebook friends or Twitter friends of the, the author who, with whom I had the exchange that I'm happy to show you. He finds it a little bit ominous that neither his boss nor HR wants to see that exchange. They don't ask for it. They don't bring it up themselves. Instead, they mention retraining at your own expense. And the reviewer thinks, well, this is a crock of crap, but I need this job. This is coming totally out of the blue. I have nothing prepared as a backup. So he decides that the first of those classes is on Tuesday. The next day, he decides he'll do it. You know, I'll just, I'll smile through it. I'll make a mental note never to engage with anyone on Twitter again. He goes in to work the next day with a note from his boss. And he goes to his boss's office and the boss says, look, those, those same people have complained again that we're not taking immediate action. The reviewer wants to say it's the same people and they live on Twitter. They have nothing else to do, literally nothing else to do, but complain every four hours to you because they stalked me and found your address. Uh, but you, he does, the reviewer doesn't say that because he needs this job. So instead he says to his boss, well, you are taking immediate action. I'm, I'm going to a sensitivity class tonight. That's one day later. Uh, and his boss takes on a very apologetic tone and says, I, I'm, I'm afraid you're an at-will employee here. I'm afraid we're just going to have to let you go. The reviewer is utterly astounded. Utterly. It, this cannot be happening. This simply cannot be happening. I made no bigoted comments about Guatemalans, male or female. All I did was say that Guatemalan men don't have wings. They can't fly. That's all I said. You know that's true. That is simply an ontological, objective fact of reality. That's all. That's all I did I, in, a, in an otherwise praiseworthy review. The reviewer wants to say all that, but he's pretty sure that would only make things worse. And so he doesn't say anything. Uh, he's stunned. He's insulted, of course, because his boss takes into no account of his service, and also because his boss takes the officious step of having a security guard stand by his desk while he clears it out, which is insult to injury. Uh, he goes home and finds a message from his condo association. And the board of his condo association has received word that he has made inflammatory racist remarks on social media. And they're reconsidering his contract. They're reconsidering his condo lease. At this point, the reviewer just sits down. He does not know what is happening in the world. All he knows is that by stating online to the author of a book that Guatemalan men don't have wings and cannot fly, that no Guatemalan man has ever had wings nor ever could fly in the course of a book review, he has lost his life. His life has fallen apart. He's, the condo board is almost certainly going to take the same route that his boss did and eventually decide if they get enough emails over the course of 12 hours to evict him. Cancel his contract and evict him. Cancel his lease and evict him. In which case, in 12 or 24 or 48 hours, he will have lost his job. Of course, no one will ever run a review by him again. He's also lost his day job, and he's also lost his home. Uh, for pointing out an element of objective reality. And the thought occurs to him in the midst of his despair, who knows what he'll do. The thought occurs to him, well, maybe I just shouldn't have done that. I mean, the book, as part of what I assume to be magical realism, says that 40% of Guatemalan men have wings and can fly. Was that a trap? Was that a baited trap? 
Did I fall into a trap that was made for me? I have no idea. Was I not supposed to comment on that fact? That divorces the book from day-to-day -day reality. Was I not supposed to comment on that? Didn't I owe a duty to readers to let them know that that detail is in there? He has no idea at all. All he knows is that those words in online uh, have destroyed his life completely. Uh, and he knows one other thing, too, which is it wasn't the Guatemalan embassy, nor was it 30 people, nor was it 50 people, nor was it 1,000 people. It was 12 people emailing his boss. That was all that it did. It was the author who claims that he does have wings and does and is able to fly, and 11 of his friends. It was that. That's what happened. That's all he knows. And that's where we'll draw the curtain on this little story. Uh, and we'll resume our mail haul and hope for the best. Now, I have a book that I opened on camera yesterday. It was one of five. It was the only one. That, it's the only one that I'm going to show you today. And then, stupidly, in hindsight, I have an, un an unopened package that I'm going to open for you on camera. Now, I... I my guard is completely up. I already think that just on the basis of that story that I told you, I'm not going to upload this video, but just on the basis of my guard is up, but we're going to, we're going to try this because a part of me, a stubborn part of me, uh, wants to continue on camera live mail halls. They're lots of fun. Opening the packages together has been fun for seven years. That's lots of fun. When I started years and years ago, I did not expect carefully laid traps. I did not expect that the world had changed, <laughs> that the world would change, and that I would have to say, it's always been like that. Didn't you notice? Uh, so I didn't expect any of that, and it makes opening mail on camera in an unguarded moment uh, unbelievably perilous. To everybody, I should point out, to all of you, any comment, anything at all, that, <laughs> but, but it's a needless peril because there's plenty of other stuff to make videos about. So we're going to try this, but this has been, in 2023, this has been a few disastrous turns here. I'm not going, I'm not willing to keep having them and just finish 45 minutes of filming and say, well, I can't, I'm not going to upload that. I'm just going to delete it. So that was wasted time. Uh, I, have a, I have a lot of time and I use it well, but I can't, even I can't afford to lose 15 minutes in a day to nothing. Uh, so we're going to, we're going to try this and see how it works. Uh, having told you a completely unconnected and random story that doesn't bear on anything and that isn't meant to be read as an allegory of anything. I just thought I'd tell you a story. That's all. Uh, so we're going to start off with the New York Review of Books, uh, which is a, a, a relentlessly political issue. There was, there's very little in here that's a review of anything that I would want to read uh, or that I would want to think about. Uh, there's a long review of uh, an art exhibit that I think is in New York City of a uh, great Venetian artist. I would love to see the exhibit. Is it in New York City? Oh, no, it's in Venice. Uh, it's in Venice and D.C. Um, it's a, a, a whole show about a, a, a Renaissance port, a painter named Carpaccio that I would really, I'd love to see it in person. I'd love to get, I'm sure there's a book that goes along with it, although not one is not mentioned in this review. But I'd, I'd love to uh, see it. I don't think it will ever come here. But the, the pretty much the only article that I could read in here uh, with, uh, with a neutral scale was uh, Tim Flannery, the great nature writer Tim Flannery, who writes a double review of that new book on koalas and the, a little bit older book on platypuses. And he, he does them together, and he, as is his way, he makes it into a wonderful thing. It's just a wonderful piece on its own. Of course, I will cut it out and trim it and date it and save it and fold it and put it in my copy of that koala book. Uh, and then the other periodical has a, a weird coincidence with one of yesterday's library tours. <laughs> this is The New New Yorker, uh, and it's a double issue, and standing in for Eustace Tilly is a beagle. I didn't see that coming, <laughs> didn't, uh, uh, but uh, th there were a lot of interesting things in this issue. This is a very literary issue, which uh, last week's was not. Uh, there's one really neat here. There was an, an article in the last one. Rachel Monroe wrote a book about how maybe 3D printing could solve the homeless crisis in America. Just print up a lot of houses, make houses for people. I read that article and I thought, well, surely... Surely houses 
the number of houses is not the problem. And uh, somebody wrote in from uh, uh, Chicago, Champaign-Urbana, the University of Chicago at Champaign-Urbana, and wrote in and, and made that point, that the point is not the, the number of empty houses. There are millions of empty houses in the United States. The, the point is the obstacles in a whole bunch of other areas, mostly legal. Uh, but there are plenty of places. You don't need to make more places. You just need to change residency, the hoops that residency goes through. So I was glad to see that. Uh, and there was also uh, a cartoon that I quite liked. Uh, well, actually, there were two. There's one that's very common. I've read it. I've heard it a million times. Uh, it's this one here. You have the the Cowardly Lion, the Tin Man, and, and the Scarecrow sitting, conferring with each other about Dorothy. There she is off in the back in the distance with her little dog. And the, the caption reads, if she's from Kansas, why doesn't she have a Midwestern accent? <laughs> Which is a standard thing. It, it's a stand, It's not just... Funny, it's also a standard uh, callback to uh, regional regional Americans who who say, "Well, if you're from the Midwest, why don't you have a Midwest accent?" When because famously there there isn't a Midwest accent, or that's the idea that it's kind of a blank slate. Once upon a time in the 1950s and 60s, major networks looked for anchors who had the so-called Midwestern accent, which is no accent at all. The last thing they wanted was somebody from Boston reading the news, half the, half the words would be uh, inarticulate. Uh, same thing with all the other regions, you know, all the other, like, Texas or the Deep South or whatever. Uh, so I thought that was neat, but the one that, the one that really pleased me uh, was this. A little dog is explaining to a big dog why they tore apart this teddy bear. <laughs> the caption really does capture a certain little dog I know. The caption is, he continued to taunt me. Frankly, I don't know what else can be done. <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is truer to life than I like to admit. <laughs> uh, but this had uh, lots of literary stuff in it. It had, uh, let me see here, uh, David Remnick did a great piece on Salman Rushdie briefly glancing at Victory City, his new book, mainly talking about the attack that he went through on stage, where a guy crawled up on stage and stabbed him repeatedly before anyone could pull him off and stop him. But it also naturally does a, the Remnick thing. It does a huge retrospect of, of Rushi's career and his life, the, his, the fatwa, his years uh, living you know, a fugitive existence because of the fatwa, his decision not to live that way anymore. Really, really well done. And there's also... Uh, there was another uh, really good literary thing. Where was it? Uh, yes, uh, Joan Acquacella does a review of uh, Alison Turner's new book on the Wife of Bath, her literary biography of the Wife of Bath. It's ten times longer than the review that I ran. It's ten times better than the review that I ran. I will, again, cut it out, trim it, date it, and put it in my copy of the Wife of Bath. So those were the two magazines. Now my heart is pounding because now we're, we get to the books. One of the books we're safe. Uh, it's already open, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. It comes out in June. It's by Deborah Willis, and it's called Girlfriend on Mars. It's a novel called Girlfriend on Mars, and there's a, there's someone on Mars taking a selfie, making the peace sign, and whatnot. Pretty interesting. Pretty good. Uh, and it came with a little Mars postcard, which is kind of neat. I'll use that as my bookmark in the summer. Uh, here's what this is about. This is a novel coming out in the summer. Amber Kivenen is moving to Mars. Or at least she will be if she wins a chance to join the Mars Now program. She and 23 reality TV contestants from around the world, including a hunky Israeli soldier, is there any other kind, uh, an endearing fellow Canadian, and an assortment of science nerds and wannabe influencers, are competing for two seats on the first human-led mission to Mars, sponsored by billionaire Jeff Task. Meanwhile, Kevin, Amber's boyfriend of 14 years, was content going nowhere until Amber left him and their hydroponic weed business behind. <laughs> As he tends to the plants growing in their absurdly overpriced Vancouver basement apartment, Kevin tunes in to find out why the love of his life is so determined to leave the planet with somebody else. <laughs> so that sounds really good. Uh, and I, I showed this on camera already. I had to destroy that video, so I wanted to make sure you knew this. So that, sounds, that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, and that comes out in the summer. And then, heart pounding, we have a package that is not open yet. So this is the make or break for whether or not I will post this video. And I don't, if since there's a chance that I won't post this video, I have no idea who I'm saying this to. 
But if this doesn't work, we're going to have to rethink live mail halls here. That's just as simple as that. Even if it does work, we're going to have to rethink it because I'm not going to waste 50 minutes a day just to get an occasional successful mail upload. <laughs> so let, let's see what we have here. I almost want a drum roll, except it'd be a funeral procession. Oh, okay. Bless the folks that live right. They never let me down. They never lead me astray. Fantastic. Okay, this comes out in June. Uh, I don't have a pub sheet for it, but it is right up Steve Alley. It's one of three books very much like this coming out in 2023. One we've seen already. This is by David Blackburn, and it is called Germany in the World. 1500 to the year 2000, a global history. Black and white photo, yes, but you have to admit that cover design fixes it. That cover design saves it. Uh, that is an interesting way to do this. Uh, fantastic. All right, this comes out in June. With Germany in the world, award-winning historian David Blackburn radically revises conventional narratives of German history, demonstrating the existence of a distinctly German presence in the world centuries before its unification and revealing a national identity far more complicated than previously imagined. Oh my, that sounds great. Most historians don't like to do that. German states, yes, German kingdoms, yes, but not a German identity. Not before the country was unified. When it was, you know, one pocket kingdom after another, then there couldn't be a national identity. So that's fascinating uh, that the author would try to do that. Uh, the author traces Germans... Germany's evolution from the loosely bound Holy Roman Empire of 1500 to a sprawling colonial power to a 21st century beacon of democracy. Viewed through a global lens, familiar landmarks of German history, the Reformation, the Revolution of 1848, the Nazi regime, are re transformed, while others are unearthed and explored, as Blackburn reveals Germany's leading role in the creation of modern universities and its sinister involvement in slave trade economies. A global history for a global age well, that's interesting. Do we live in a global age? That's, are we saying the globalists have won? <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, Germany in the world is a bold and original account that upends the idea that a nation's history should be written as though it took place entirely within the nation's borders. Oh, 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 oh. Whoever wrote this cover copy earned their paycheck. That is really good. A global history for a global age, Germany in the world is a bold and original account that upends the idea that a nation's history should be written as though it took place entirely within a nation's borders. <laughs> it's going to drive Alex Jones crazy, but I love it. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Uh, I'm, I'm worried about reading the, the author bio, but, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, we'll read the author bio, and then I, this works. Aside from my little my little fairy tale, which I again I, I want to point out was an allegory. It's not connected to anything at all in real life. Uh, aside from that, this mail hall might actually be uploadable, uh, thanks to Liverite. Thank God for Liverite. The author is the Cornelius Vanderbilt Distinguished Chair of History at Vanderbilt University, and is the author of seven books. Now, didn't he read something that? Didn't he write something that I know? I could swear that he did. Uh, not sure that he did. No. The one that's coming closest is the, his latest one before this one, The Conquest of Nature, Water, Landscape, and the Making of Modern Germany. And I don't think I read that. I might have seen it in a catalog. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Fantastic. Okay, so you, there you have the long and the short of it. You have a fun novel and a serious history. And it's not just uh, a serious history. It's a serious history that does what I love histories to do, which is to take either a mildly or a deeply entrenched idea, just a kind of consensus in the historical world or in the historical narrative, and challenge it. Sometimes we've seen books on this channel, back when mail hall openings were safe, we've seen books on this channel where that long entrenched idea was deeply entrenched and the author took it on anyway. And then we've seen, this is a little bit more lightly entrenched, but this author is saying that there's been a German national identity long before there was a unified Germany. That, and also the hint on the back of the cover there is that that reading of German history will change how we read major events in German history. Can't wait. Absolutely can't wait. That is great. Uh, so there you go. 30 minutes for two books. That was a mail haul. And I believe I can upload this. <laughs> I believe that I can. Uh, I'm going to watch it over again. I'll probably watch it three or four times. But uh, uh it looks to me, I mean, I like to tell stories that aren't grounded in reality, that don't have any effect on anything. I like to tell those stories all the time. So that's no bar. 
Surely, that's no bar. So I'll, I will watch this four or five times, I will vet it, and then I will have a long, serious think about whether or not this level of heart palpitation is worth it. That's the ultimate question here, right? No other booktube channel opens mail on camera. Not regularly. Not mail they get from publishers. A gift they might open on camera, but most of them, no. There's no actual reason for it. I didn't even start off on this channel doing that. My, the, my original showing you mail was showing you things that I had already examined from the mail that had been opened a long time ago by somebody else. At worst, I could go back to that. At worst, effectively, what I'm saying is I could, go, I could vet my mail. That would still preserve new releases, uh, but it would get rid of wasted time on my part, so I'm going to have to think about it. But anyway, this worked for now, so I will wrap this up, and I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.